morning, and thank you so much, Arun, from the other California. We have one California, don't worry. <laughs> North and South come together here, certainly. And it's just a joy to be with, you know, for anybody who's ever invested in or uh, been affiliated with the bond market, we know that the highest rating, at least in one of the rating companies, is triple A. So to be with Atul, Arun, and Arun, the three A's, we've got triple A rating here today of superstars who are really the bridge between US and India in trade and in technology. Um, and I'm so proud to serve as my country's representative here in this incredibly powerful moment. It's palpable, as Atul was saying, in terms of the relationship in the past. I always say it's more like Facebook status. <laughs> if the US and India in the past had to put their Facebook status, for a long time it's complicated. Now we're definitely dating. And we're trying to figure out whether we're going to move in together or what the future holds. But it's an exciting moment in which we have a relationship really based on friendship that has too many limits on it. And little by little, we're taking those limits apart, away, and imagining with ambition what we could do to be our future backwards-looking selves. And 20 years from now, think about this moment and this gathering, and to think about this time, these visits, these comings together of government and of business and of people to people, to say this was a moment which we did the right thing, not just for India, not just for the United States, but together for the world. I often say that the years tell us things that the days cannot see, and that's why I always love looking at history and understanding this relationship. But when it comes to technology, we're living in a moment which we probably don't have full clarity on. It's a moment in which we see technology that sometimes can divide us, technology that can sometimes harm us, technology that can make us less healthy. I mean, you think through any parents out there, the struggle we have with our children, making sure they know how to interact in the three-dimensional and real world, the way that governments use technology to oppress the people that they serve and that technology is supposed to help. So in contrast to that vision of harm and of division and of unhealthiness, the United States and India are putting together a different vision of technology. Technology that instead of dividing us, connects us. Technology instead of harming us, protects us. Technology instead of making us less healthy, detects for us some of the biggest challenges and addresses them. I'm gonna be engaged with technology all day today. I leave here and get on the transportation technology that is the Delhi metro system. And I'm gonna take a trip to uh, a, a company that we're funding, an organization that we're working with uh, that uses US aid funds to be able to use your phone, among other things. And as an Indian, you can cough into the phone, send a recording of that cough, and with 85% in growing accuracy, detect whether you have TB from any village, any town, anywhere, in India, something that will help us reach the goal of the Prime Minister here to get rid of TB by 2025, and something that's in America's interest selfishly as well, because 25% of the world's TB cases are here in India. And if we don't work with India to eradicate tuberculosis here, we won't ever have an America without tuberculosis as well. I'll think through the ways that we have been able to, in each of those categories, engage with technology, whether it's building a 5G system without technology that can spy on us or that can endanger our national security, as India has shown while reducing the price of data by 90%, democratizing access to and laying a platform for healthcare, laying a platform for um, transactions, laying a platform for so much that can enrich the quality of life and connect people. Yesterday, I always joke that, you know, Two countries acting together are just a line, but here in India, we love our shapes, quadrilateral organizations like the Quad, uh, two of them now with I2U2, but also trilateral work that US and India are doing together. And last night I received at my home the largest group to ever be trained from the nation of Fiji, a place that has strong cultural ties back to India, a group of doctors and medical professionals who are being trained by the Indian government with US funds on telemedicine that can help healthcare come to the most remote islands in Fiji, can come to those places instantaneously before a doctor can physically get there, literally save lives around the world. You see, when we connect 
protect and detect with technology, instead of fearing what it can do to divide us or oppress us or to make us less healthy or harm us. We see a vision, I think, of what we can accomplish together. And I want to thank Celeste Capital for convening us together with the USIBC, two great pillars, one a nonprofit, a one for-profit, that can show that each one of us have lanes of action to take, together with our government and this president and our National Security Council that really laid out the boldest vision uh, for U.S. and Indian cooperation. Another example of this was recently I was at an Indian company, a technological breakthrough in healthcare, we were able to develop a vaccine for dengue fever, all four strains. In the past, you can get a vaccine for one strain, but it doesn't protect you from the other three. Very difficult to commercialize. We had the innovation, but we knew that America probably couldn't do the delivery. And so given to three different Indian companies, one which is now in about to start its third phase of clinical trials, within a year or two, maybe three, we can have a vaccine that deals with all four strains of dengue fever and imagine a future without that disease hospitalizing or even taking the lives of people around the world. The US and India are not an additive, arithmetic relationship. They are a multiplicative, a exponential relationship. It's not US plus India, it's US times India. And when it comes to technology, I really do believe in my heart that as we showed during the G20 with India's leadership and empowering the voice of the global south and America's leadership among our allies in the developed world, that when we speak each other's languages, we can actually translate to the world our ambitions. Our ambitions in peace, prosperity for our planet and our people. The four Ps as I call them and the vision that I brought here to India of how America and India can work together. And those four things, to have a more peaceful world, God knows at this moment how badly we need that and can see that. Second, the prosperity that we can inspire by using technology in the right way and the innovative way. The planet, which is crying out from climate and health for our co-operation and our co-work. And then lastly, of course, our people. Those four things overlaid with a fifth P, that of principles of two democracies, have the power to change everything. So I thank you for engaging in technology in a way that works. And I'll leave you with this for our Indian friends, and I've loved the engagement of the United States government and India's government. And I think this is a message as much for America as it is for India, so please take it that way. With three paradoxes. One, this is happening, but it's not happening quickly enough. So when you look at this, deep transformation will not happen quickly enough in this country, in our country, between our countries and in the world if we don't accelerate, reducing the barriers that have been, in many ways, the tradition here and part of our own bureaucracy in the United States too. If we truly have this ambition, do not find the excuses to not get there and don't think that this pace will deliver what we hope. Second, this is the place with the greatest in the moment, with the greatest possibility of real breakthroughs, but it is also the moment in our lives of the greatest possibility of real threats. Technology not wrapped by values and regimes that can constrain. We think about augmented or artificial intelligence. It's one place that we've been digging in on this. Don't just become tech um, idealists, but be tech realists about making sure that it's human-centered technology and not technology-centered technology. And finally, the last piece is what I already said. There are no two nations on this globe who together can do this work better, fill each other's weaknesses with the other's strengths, and show a model of what it means to do with democratic values that pe put people in the center of this technological revolution. And if we can do that, our future backwards-looking selves will remember this moment in this hotel room, these words in this convening, as one of those moments which we wrote a chapter that changed the world. Thank you all so much. Okay. What do you want me here? Yes. That was magnificent. Thanks. Okay. Those were, thank you for those very profound sure. comments. I thought I'd just explore a couple of other topics, related topics. One is, uh, as I mentioned, you are a very successful mayor of Los Angeles. And uh, in the United States, cities and states 
are really the engines of economic advance. Uh, in India too, uh, we see some states engaging deeply, others less so. Any thoughts on how uh, the subnational engagement between the US and India can, uh, can actually help this relationship become transformative in the sense that you described it? It's a great question, and, and obviously one of the things I love are cities and subnational diplomacy. I give the example when I chaired something called C40 Cities, which is the only association of kind of the mayors of the 100 most populous cities of the world, about a quarter of the world's GDP through cities, um, that when the pandemic hit and I pressed that button and got on a new thing called a Zoom call, the speed with which we were able to share information, the mayor of uh, Seoul talking about drive-through testing when we didn't know what that name was, the mayor of Milan talking about how we got our hospitals ready to prepare for the, the sick. We were implementing those the next day. And a national leader, it was the, uh, remember Boris Johnson, when he was prime minister, talked to his mayor, and uh, the mayor was telling him about this call, and he said, well, why aren't we doing it this quickly? And his ministers and others said, we're preparing reports, we'll get it to you in the next couple of weeks, then you can engage with national leaders. And he said, that will be months, and people will be dead. And I think at the subnational level, the speed of innovation, the speed of execution, is at a whole other level. We're the entrepreneurs of government. And I'm very excited here in India to see what we can do to launch a US-India's uh, cities partnership. But India has the excitement of urbanization and the challenges of urbanization. And overlaid on that is a tradition of not necessarily empowering the subnational level of governance. And I think we all went through this. We don't say this in any paternalistic way. Think about New York when it exploded. It had no city planning. And London when it became this polluted mess. When growth happens more quickly than you can plan, the importance of urban planning and empowering a democratic system that gives local governments the ability to tax, the ability to collect, the ability to zone, leads to accountability. You know, here, when we had flooding in Delhi, remember this earlier in the summer? Everybody said, whose fault is it? When nobody's in charge, everybody says, it's your fault. When you have cities that say there are clear leaders and clear, um, uh, clear elections, um, besides some exceptions, there's a great article in The Economist about this, there hasn't been a tradition of uh, giving that power, devolving that power at the local level. And in my humble opinion, I think it would be something that would enrich uh, the speed with which India could urbanize and address urban challenges from pollution to health, economic empowerment, to transportation, traffic, to uh, housing uh, more quickly. No, thank you. If I might just uh, switch the topic a bit towards um, California and India. Yes. So California leads the world in what one might call uh, industries of the imagination and the intellect, from movies in Southern California and technology yeah. in North and South, actually. Um, India has many of the same characteristics in terms of the enterprise, the imagination, uh, advanced um, education. Uh, so what are your impressions in that space of India in the few months that you've been here? And what are your thoughts about the path forward? It's exceptional. I just came back from Mumbai where I was for three days. For the first time in 44 years, the International Olympic Committee had its uh, biannual meeting here in India. And we were at the new Ambani Center, and Nita Ambani, who's the only uh, Indian member of the International Olympic Committee, put on the most exceptional party where we saw Indian culture, the Prime Minister spoke, the President of the International Olympic Committee. And then we had a working meeting surrounded by that innovation. Bollywood and Tollywood performers, um, the history of culture and religion and pluralism here in India. We got to celebrate together, dance together, literally all of these things. And I think you're right, this is a place, the American dream and the Indian dream are just flip sides of the same thing. The idea of working hard, doesn't matter where you come from, what region, what language. The idea that you work hard, get into a good school, maybe start a company, whatever it is, you can do anything, the sky's the limit. But I'll take the example of sports. We're in the middle of the World Cup. I couldn't have scripted this. I'm from Hollywood, but I literally couldn't have scripted this better. I get to be ambassador to India during the World Cup. On the day of India-Pakistan match, the biggest match in the world, there's really, everybody in America is like, what's our equivalent? I'm like, there is no equivalent. We, we just don't have one. As LA28, a bid that I a championed and was able to win Olympics for my city, was here giving an update on the five sports we were going to add as the American Olympics. And there's four others, lacrosse and squash, um, lacrosse, which is an American created sport, by the way, 
um, baseball, softball, and uh, football, American football. But the fifth one was the only one anybody wanted to hear about. I got to announce that cricket, for the first time since 1900, when there was a single game played, and by the way, Britain has been the champion for the last 123 years because of it, um, <laughs> we're going to bring cricket back. And it pulled together for me those industries of imagination at a moment when, did you know that America is the second biggest country of cricket streamers in the world? Americans don't know that, but it's true. You don't have to choose between baseball, cricket. I've become a cricket nut, and I've always been a, a baseball fan. So I think when we combine those kind of mashups of whether it's Hollywood and Bollywood, whether it's sports that bring us together, we have Major League Cricket now in America. It's an opening for you as Indians. Bring it. It's a great time to invest, by the way. If I were not in government, I would invest in a major league cricket team in America. It's going to be like 10 years of carrying a lot of debt. You're not going to make a lot of money in the first decade. But just as they said with soccer, they would never work in America. And now those teams have such a valuation. It's a great investment, I think. That's just your investment tip from the ambassador today. Um, but this is a way of imagining something none of us would have thought possible. And last thing I'll say is we played a video when we made this announcement. And it was of an Indian American girl. She's an American. She's of Indian descent, who lives in Southern California and plays cricket. And she was describing this game and what it does to her and for her. And I could see her being potentially, because she said, by 2028, I'll be 22 years old. And America gets a team no matter what, because that's what happens when you put a sport in. We don't have a cricket team really nationally now. But I could see this young girl become a young woman who might be a medalist in her own hometown with a sport nobody would have imagined would have been in the Olympics, let alone played in America. Lovely story. <laughs> well, lovely story. On that note, thank you very much, Ambassador. Mm -hmm.